Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to this presentation tonight. Um, as uh, Tim pointed out, my name is John Bosser. Um, I'm uh, the president of uh, Turbo Rock and the Earthwide organization that uh, seeks to kind of develop some of this technology, but uh, um, it's uh, part of the other work that I do. And, and so that's kind of the uh, uh, unit that we're kind of representing tonight. My presentation is called the Turbo Rocket, an integrated pump-fed rocket engine for propulsion applications. In my presentation today, what I'm going to be covering is what a turbo rocket is, how it works, its basic functionality is, and its performances um, as a propulsion device. Um, I'll also be discussing some of its applications um, and some practical implications of the turbo rocket engine system. Um, I'll close with some uh, interesting uh, ideas for some combined cycle engines in which the turbo rocket so the rocket engine can be combined with other systems to make some novel and unique propulsion options. I'd like to point out that the technology that I'm presenting here is all open source. The turbo rocket stuff is free to anyone that wants to use it. They can use my ideas, they can use my designs, they can use the calculation procedures that I've provided in the book. It's my feeling that only by having an open source way of using this technology will the true potential of the turbo rocket be able to be realized and more people as possible can, can possibly use that. So what is a turbo rocket exactly? A turbo rocket, or more precisely, a turbo rocket engine is an integrated pump-fed rocket engine in which the nozzles, the combustion chamber, the pump element, and the turbine element all rotate together as a solid body. The turbo rocket is an essentially an integrated pump-fed rocket engine. It's sometimes been called a rotary rocket engine. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but that is a, another term that has been used to describe this type of engine. Now, I've chosen to use the word turbo rocket, one word, turbo rocket, no hyphen, no space, kind of like turbo jet, but with rocket replacing jet. And the reason for that is there was a company called Rotary Rocket Engine, uh, run by Gary Hudson, a good friend and colleague of mine, um, that tried to develop related technologies. And so I felt like the word Rotary Rocket Engine was too closely integrated with the company name. And the word turbo rocket gave it a more generic name than anyone could use. The engine that we'll see uh, is fully throttle. You can change the speed up and down and change the thrust output from the system. It's fully uh, usable in any of a variety of, of rocket engine configurations, including bipropellant and monopropellant systems, um, and any of a variety of propellant combinations that the user might conceive of. The engine is scalable. We can have uh, very small types of engines up to possibly very large size engines. Typically, Pump-fed rocket engines on the small scale, say below a few hundred pounds, are very difficult to develop, and there aren't very many, if any. The turbo rocket may suit that role very well as a very small scale pump-fed rocket engine. And as I mentioned, the turbo rocket, because of its unique attributes, including its small round shape and its capacity to produce shaft power, enables it to be integrated with other air breathing engine systems for some unique performance attributes. The turbo rocket takes its basic form from, from, from Hero's wheel or Hero's, Hero's alio pile that you might recall as the uh, uh, fascinating uh, device from antiquity, the brass sphere heated with steam, uh, steam jets emerging from the arms causing it to spin around. Or more closely, the, your standard kind of lawn sprinkler. We have water coming in, it flows out the arms, the nozzles are at an angle, and the angle imparts a rotation to the system. A turbo rocket is just like a lawn sprinkler, except that instead of water going through the system, we have fuel and oxidizer going through the system, which subsequently burn and combust within the combustion chamber of the system. So let's look at a basic schematic of the turbo rocket engine system. Here we can see that the blues elements represent static or non-moving elements, or the gray are the rotating elements. Propellants come in from the end um, and enter the rotating element where they flow axially before turning radially and floating radially outwardly into the combustion chamber. Within the combustion chamber, the propellants mix, burn, and produce a hot, high-pressure jet that emerges from the nozzles of the turbo rocket engine. The nozzles, as shown in this top view, are at an angle relative to the axis of rotation, and the nozzles uh, have, therefore, two components of uh, reaction force that are generated by this jet. The tangential component of the, the jet uh, imparts a rotation to the system 
that rotates the, uh, the components, and most importantly, it centrifugally accelerates the propellants into the combustion chamber, and that's the pumping element that occurred for the rocket engine. Now, because it's a rocket engine, we want to generate axial thrust, and that is generated by the axial component of the jet velocity uh, emerging from the engine. So let's look at a kind of a more practical element uh, as opposed to our more schematic kind of uh, drawing. And so here we have uh, a layout of a turbo rocket engine that might be more typical, in which we have realistic elements uh, of the type that I've used, designed, built, and tested. So in this system, the dark gray elements are the rotor elements. These are the pieces that rotate at, um, at relatively high rotational velocities. And the, and the gray, light gray elements are the body elements. These are the static elements that react the uh, thrust loads and other uh, dynamic loads generated by the engine system. Within the engine and the combustion chamber, uh, in which the propellants are reacted and burned to produce a hot, high-pressure gas. And rocket nozzles, which have a throat and an exit area, uh, which convert the high-pressure, uh, high-temperature gas into kinetic energy, uh, which emerges from the engine, just like a normal rocket engine. Uh, injectors for the propellants are located uh, within, the combustion uh, within the combustion chamber and induce the propellants into the, um, into the combustion chamber and they can provide an atomization and mixing effect uh, for the turbo rocket engine's combustion process. Radio loads are uh, reacted through the main bearings of the system um, and also support the axial loads that are generated by the system. Secondary bearings can also be designed into the system. These can be used to support other elements and to improve, and to improve or correct uh, the rotational dynamics of the system um, as necessary. A significant element of the turbo rocket are the seals that seal the lift propellants as they uh, go through the, the static elements and into the rotating elements uh, of the turbo rocket engine system. Here's a fuel seal. This keeps the fuel that goes into the fuel side from exiting the engine, which might be kind of a loss mechanism. And there's also uh, a more important seal, which is the inner propellant seal. This is a type of dynamic seal that exists between the propellant sources. It's important to keep the propellants separated until they get into the combustion chamber mix and burn. You don't want to have propellant mixing prior to the, uh, uh, the uh, propellants getting into the chamber. So we can show how this system works by imagining uh, oxidizer entering the turbo rocket system, filling various orifices uh, within the um, turbo rocket body and then flowing axially and turning radially um, into the uh, rotating elements, and then entering the uh, injector elements of the, uh, of the combustion chamber. The fuel is likewise introduced in a similar way and also is injected into the system. The high rotational speeds of the system cause the propellants to be flung at high uh, dynamic pressures uh, into the combustion chamber where they're atomized, vaporized, mix and burn to produce a hot, high pressure uh, gas that emerges from the nozzles of the system. Looking on the end view, we can see that the nozzles being at an angle, uh, a, a tangential component of these uh, exhaust jets imparts a rotation to the system and causes the system to rotate. If we remove that cover, we can see the inside of the system, and we can see that during rotation, the propellants are centrifugally accelerated in a pump-like action out to the outside of the uh, combustion chamber, where they are injected into the combustion chamber mixing and burning and producing this high pressure gas. The gas exits from the nozzle and imparts a rotation to the system. So it's not pretty clear kind of how that works. It's pretty simple. Um, and uh, you know, it's pretty intuitive how this thing works. The, the simplicity of the system, however, belies some uh, interesting and unusual uh, complications with regards to the coupling and interaction of the propellants and the overall system, which we'll discuss in this presentation. Okay, now we're going to get a little, little bit of math here. So uh, nothing too, uh, too terrible bad. You should be able to uh, grok the, the general ideas. And these uh, things are available online, so you can look at those and pour over them in your copious spare time. <laughs> so we can analyze the performance of the turbo rocket system by considering it as a type of turbine system. And in this turbine system, as shown here, we have fluid entering. Um, with some velocity and mass flow rate uh, at some uh, inlet radius, and a flow rate exiting from the system at a mass flow rate and an exit velocity. V theta out is the absolute velocity exiting from the system. And the system is rotating at some rotational velocity u. 
gamma forces, uh, gamma are the, some of the torques on the system, so there could be torques applied to the system. Now, we may have a jet emerging uh, from the turbine system, and this uh, relative tangential jet velocity, we've termed V sub theta jet. This is the, uh, the velocity that is relative to the rotating wheel. This would be the velocity that you would see if you were a little man riding around on a wheel. You would see this velocity leaving from the system. Now, the absolute tangential velocity is therefore the difference between the relative jet velocity, V theta jet, and the rotational velocity. So V theta out is equal to V theta jet minus the rotational velocity. And we'll need that uh, relationship in just a moment, which you'll see. Okay. A few equations here, nothing too boring. The top line is known as the moment of momentum equation. This is the rotational analog of linear momentum. So we know from linear momentum, F equals MA, that we can say in a linear system that F equals MA, we can also say more correctly or more completely that the time rate of change of the linear momentum increase of the system is equal to the sum of the forces applied to the system, right? Well, we have the same analogy that can apply to rotational systems. And we can say, as this equation says, that the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the system is equal to the mass to the angular momentum mass flux through the angular momentum flux through the system represented by these mass flows plus the sum of the torques on the system. So that's all that system says. It's just the uh, rotational uh, analog of uh, F equals M A. Now we can impart an, an important simplification to this system um, by assuming steady state operation. And if we have steady state operation, then the DL dt term is zero. And also the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. So we can just take that out as one term. So we can reduce moment of momentum equation to the equation shown here, which gamma equals the mass flow rate times the difference in these radiuses times velocities. This is an important equation. This is known as Euler's turbine equation. It was developed by Leonard Euler uh, in the 1850s as a way to understand uh, dynamic rotating systems. And the system is uh, a very common and well-known system in turbo machinery applications. If any of you are turbo machinery engineers or developers of that will recognize this. This equation is useful uh, and it applies to both pumps and turbines. Pumps being a power input device and turbines being a power extraction device. We can take Euler's uh, turbine equation and we can multiply it by the angular velocity of the system, omega. And this is how we obtain the power generated by such a system. So the power out of the system is omega times m dot times these uh, radius times velocity terms. We can do a one further simplification in that we can neglect the inlet radius, r sub n, and consider that kind of negligible. And that reduces to this equation that we have on the bottom. It's power equals the rotational velocity times the mass flow rate times r out times v theta out, the absolute exit velocity. Okay, now remember that term, the absolute uh, velocity is the difference between the relative and outlet velocity. We can plug that term back into this equation, and now we have power equals omega in dot times that expression. But you may recognize now that omega times r out is the rotational velocity u. And so now our equation reduces the power out equals m dot times two terms. The first term, u v theta, j, uh, v theta jet, represents the absolute jet power produced by the system. It's the absolute magnitude of power that we can extract that comes off of that relative jet exiting from the turbine system. The second term, u squared, is an interesting term, and it's different. This term is the amount of power required to centrifugally accelerate the propellant entering the system up to the rotational velocity of the system. It is, in essence, the pump power required to accelerate the incoming propellant for mass flux, m dot, up to the rotational velocity of u. So the net power produced by the system is the difference between these two terms, the absolute jet power and the pump power required. We can graphically represent these terms in this plot here. In this plot, on the y-axis, I'm showing the power per unit mass flow rate. I've basically taken out of the, the mass flow rate divided it on both sides. It's kind of a power per unit flow rate. And on the y, on the x-axis, I'm, I'm plotting it against the rotational velocity u. And so we can see these two terms and their differences shown here. 
the absolute magnitude of the jet velocity, uv stated as a jet, is shown as the red line. And the absolute jet velocity is a linear function of the rotational velocity. So it just goes up as a straight line, the red line shown here. The uh, u squared term, the pump power, goes up as the square of the rotational velocity. It is shown as the blue line. And you can see it curves up. The difference between those two terms, as shown in our power equation, is the net shaft power produced by the system. And that's shown as this green dotted line. So there are some very important attributes that are shown in this chart. And the first is that the maximum shaft power produced by this type of turbine system, in which you have jet velocities leaving a turbine wheel, um, occurs when the rotational velocity is equal to one half the absolute, uh, the relative jet velocity emerging from the system. So, so if you can imagine a turbine wheel, and uh, it's rotating, uh, say, 100 feet a second to my right, spinning around at a U of 100 feet a second to my right. And you have this jet velocity, the relative jet velocity of 200 feet a second shooting out to my left. The uh, absolute velocity of that jet velocity coming out then is the difference between those two. So that a jet is coming out at an absolute velocity of 100 feet a second. Does that kind of make sense? OK. So we have this thing spinning. That 100 feet a second absolute jet velocity that emerges at the maximum power position, power per unit mass flow rate in the system is an energy loss mechanism. We can't recover that kinetic energy in that jet flow, and it represents a loss of the system. This is why this type of turbine system is inefficient. It's one of the most inefficient of the turbine systems. Uh, its simplicity allowed it to be used for turbine systems in the past and historically. But in today's world, we, we have better understandings of turbine systems and we, we don't use this type of configuration. If you were looking at this turbine system as a knowledgeable turbo machinery person, an engineer would look at, you might conclude that because the maximum power per unit mass flow rate occurs at this one half V theta jet term, that the efficiency uh, would be low on this turbine system, and therefore the turbo rocket system as an ensemble system would also be low and would therefore not be worth considering. And you would be wrong. And this was the fundamental <clears throat> misapprehension on the turbo rocket engine system. Because the turbo rocket does not operate at u equals 1 half v theta jet. It operates here, at this u max condition. At the u max condition, all of the power generated by the jet velocity is absorbed by accelerating the propellant up to the rotational velocity. It crosses at that point, and no more external shaft power can be produced by the system. The turbo rocket reaches a dynamic equilibrium condition at the U-max condition. This condition was not appreciated for the operation of the turbo rocket system. Given, in the absence of friction, and left to its own devices, a turbo rocket engine with a given jet velocity will dynamically <coughs> accelerate up to the U-maximum condition and, and reach equilibrium and stay there. So this is a fundamentally important point about the operation of the turbo rocket engine, and you're hearing it explicated perhaps for the first, first time. Yes. Is that correct. only because there's an absence of shaft power? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Um, if you extract shaft power, then, then it shifts to the it, left. It moves on down. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and I think this was the fundamental concept of the turbo rocket engine that was kind of misapprehended, yeah. and therefore the turbo rocket engine system was kind of dismissed as, as sub-efficient. OK. So let's move on. Let's move back to our little schematic here um, and talk about a few other things that are interesting and unique to the turbo rocket engine system. By the way, let me just go back real fast here. Were there any other questions on that? This is an important point. Uh, and I, I, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, and I hope you guys think it's cool. Yes. So, so the, the V theta jet is only the radial component of the exhaust? That's correct. It's only the tangential component um, of the jet velocity, yes. Okay. Um, and it is uh, independent, by the way. Um, we can consider it independent of the, of the rotation of the system. It's, a, it's a, a function of the energy available in the system, whether it's hydrostatic head from a pressurized water system or an exothermic combustion reaction that may occur in a rocket engine. Okay, I got a nomenclature question about your previous slide there. I noticed that you choose to keep uh, capital U and capital U squared separate and not factor out MU. Do those terms, those terms 
mean something to you that is specific in terms of the way you're presenting it, right? Um, the, the u v theta and the u squared as opposed to pulling out a u. Is that what yes, you exactly. Thank you for so, so pointing that out. Let me see into that genre. What, what do those things mean to you that are so... So if you want to... Algebraically, it kind of freaks me out, right? Um, it, yes, yes. But it means something to John. It means something okay. to me because it expresses this... So when I see this equation as a rocket guy, as a turbo machine guy, I see a power balance. I see a net power difference between an absolute jet power produced by the system and a pump power absorbed by the system. And that's why I grouped them that way. And that's that's interesting that you point that out. Thank you. You got like an n dot v squared is like a kinetic energy term. Yes. And the other one is your momentum term. Yes. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Tim. Yeah. Um, if you when you walk away from the uh, podium, uh, take them. Uh, just take the mic with you. That way we can pick up. Make sure we can pick up uh, what you say. All right. I'll start pruning if I have to carry this down. Uh, it's only it's only whenever you, you do that. Oh, it's only whenever you walk up to the uh the, to the board. Um, the, the projector. Yeah. I try to speak louder when I do that. All right. Well, uh, we'll we'll we'll, we'll uh, keep you chained to the rostrum. Left. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to our schematic. Oh yes, Maurice. So uh, there's some interesting developments to that um, that I, I think I will address later. Um, but um, uh, the way to think about it is um, because all of the tangential uh, power is generated at the Umax condition, the absolute jet emerging from the turbo rocket has no tangential component, which is good. Uh, and so uh, that means from, a, from a, an efficiency standpoint, it's actually quite good. And better than it would be um, if we were just taking shaft power out of the system. So all of the shaft power that we produce by the system, we efficiently load into the acceleration of the propellant up to the rotation velocity. And that's kind of the magic of this system. OK. So uh, there's a couple things that I want to mention that I think are important um, on the system. Um, obviously, you know, the beta angle, as given there, is an important design parameter of the turbo rocket engine because it determines the magnitude of the components um, uh, of the rocket, uh, of the jet velocity that are coming out. The tangential component, the sine beta, is the uh, component that provides the pumping power, and the uh, cosine beta, the uh, tangential, uh, the axial component, is our thrust, which we want because we're a propulsion system. In a conventional rocket engine, the jet velocity that emerges from our rocket chamber um, is a function of the chamber pressure, right? The higher the chamber pressure, the higher the jet velocity. However, in a conventional rocket engine, the chamber pressure is not a function of the jet velocity. We actually arrive at the chamber pressure independently of the jet velocity. It does not influence, it, it does not influence the chamber pressure in a conventional rocket engine. However, in the turbo rocket engine, like in a conventional rocket engine, the jet velocity is a function of the chamber pressure. However, the chamber pressure is also a function of the jet velocity. And that is because it is the tangential component of the jet velocity that imparts the rotational pumping action to the system. And those two terms are coupled. And this is one of the technical difficulties of ascertaining uh, the performance of the turbo rocket engine. So, um, I'd like to, if you take away nothing from this presentation, I'd like you to take away these, these three points. The first is, as mentioned, the turbo rocket engine, turbo rocket engine reaches a dynamic equilibrium operating condition uh, such that the rotational velocity is equal to the tangential component of the uh, absolute, uh, of the relative jet velocity. And it's not occurring when u equals one half v jet maximum shaft power output condition. The result of jet velocity and the chamber pressure in the turbo rocket engine are coupled, unlike a conventional rocket engine. And one last thing to point out is that in a conventional pump, the velocity that exits the pump impeller um, exits at a high velocity. 
And an important part of pump design is to design the diffuser section, which takes that high-velocity pump flow coming out of the pump, and it slows it down, and it captures, uh, it exchanges kinetic uh, velocity for rise in total pressure depth. That's what a pump does. That diffuser is a very important design and a tricky design element for pumps for a number of reasons. Uh, it's, a, it's an adverse pressure gradient. It's very turbulent. And so the design of the diffuser in a pump um, is a very tricky proposition, and pump designers spend a lot of time doing working on that. In the turbo rocket engine, the fluid velocity that exits from the pumping elements exits at the same velocity as the combustion chamber. They're rotating together. It's almost a solid body. So the diffusion is almost perfect. Uh, and this is very different than a conventional rocket engine. And so the pump performance, the effective pump performance, could be very high on these types of systems. And the price you pay for that is the complexity of a rotating system. OK. I'm going to get a little bit more math here. Nothing too scary, nothing too weird. This is our standard simplified jet velocity equation for a typical rocket engine. The jet velocity is, this is basically the first law equation. It's energy balance, conservation of energy. And it basically says that the jet velocity is a function of the gas properties, gamma ratio of specific heats, R bar, uh, gas uh, one constant. T is the combustion temperature, multiplied by this pressure term. P ambient is the ambient pressure, and P sub C is the chamber pressure. And in this representation, our chamber pressure in a conventional rocket has been expanded through a, a nozzle system to ambient pressure, which is implicit in this equation. And so that's a conventional rocket engine expression. And it applies to conventional rocket engines, but it also applies to the turbo rocket engine. We can use it to explicate the performance of, a, of the turbo rocket engine as well. But we have to know a few other terms. And as mentioned, the chamber pressure is coupled to the jet velocity. Uh, and so we have to figure out that coupling mechanism. And so this is how we can do it. Imagine a rotating cylinder uh, rotating about its axis of, axis of symmetry filled with a liquid. As that thing rotates, it generates a hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic only in the sense that um, it's all it's kind of a solid, solid body rotation, but it generates a pressure due to the rotation. I term this pressure isodynamic pressure and I use this term specifically so that it clarifies that this is the pressure generated by the rotation of the, the solid body rotation of the fluid in, in the turbo rocket system. So that pressure, that isodynamic pressure, is pretty simply represented. It equals one half times the density of the fluid times the square of the rotational velocity. Now we just got through saying that at the dynamic equilibrium operating condition, the uh, rotational velocity u, or omega r, is equal to the jet velocity, the component, the tangential component of the jet velocity. So we can actually drop that term back in, and now we have that coupling relationship between the pressure and the jet velocity. But we're not quite done yet, because the chamber pressure, uh, which is what we're trying to get at, uh, consists of a composite set of pieces. It can, it, so you can imagine propellant flowing into the turbo rocket engine system, um, it's some, there's going to be some pressure increases and some pressure decreases. So this first term, one half rho v jet squared, that's the isodynamic pressure increase caused by the rotation of the system. We add that to the supply pressure. Let's say we have some tanks and some supply pressure. And so we need to add that pressure to the resulting chamber pressure. But then we have a, a, a pressure drop across the injectors, a delta uh, p injector. This is a pressure drop that occurs, that occurs because our propellant may be flowing through a series of orifices, and it uh, results in a, in a loss of pressure um, of the fluid flowing through the system. So there's that equation again. So we want to represent the injector pressure loss. Uh, in a conventional rocket engine, we often represent the pressure drop across the injector as a fraction of the chamber pressure. So that's kind of what we've done here. We've said that the injector pressure, the delta P, the pressure drop across the injector, is a, a fraction phi of the chamber pressure. Um, in a conventional rocket engine, we often proscribe that number. We can say that we want 10 to 15 to 20 percent pressure drop across the ejector, and this does a couple of things for us. Um, it, we want a reasonable pressure drop because it decouples the pressure, possible pressure coupling in a conventional rocket engine between the, uh, the combustion chamber and the pressure propellant supply. But more importantly, that pressure drop provides the atomization process for the, for the propellant. 
And so we, we, we need some nominal uh, uh, pressure drop across the system. Now, in a conventional uh, rocket engine, we can prescribe that. We can pres prescribe that term. Uh, we can prescribe that pressure drop. In a turbo rocket engine, we, we cannot pro, uh, prescribe that, that number. Uh, we actually have to compute it um, as a series of unknowns and a series of equations. But for the sake of the presentation here, um, we'll just show it as this, this fraction of chamber pressure. And then, of course, we can rearrange that term and exceed uh, this uh, now uh, 1 over 1 plus D. That's just a, I'm just doing some algebra there to clean it up a little bit. And now we have this chamber pressure represented uh, as shown here, where P sub C equals C times these two terms. So our, our delta P of the ejector is kind of kind of baked into this representation. Okay, we're almost there. Now we have a relationship between the jet velocity and the chamber pressure for the, uh, and we can put that equation right in here. Right in here. <laughs> and when we do that, we obtain this equation. Uh, this is the fundamental, one of the fundamental equations that describes the turbo rocket performance. And you'll note that the V-jet, um, which appears on both sides of the equation, it appears on the left-hand side, but it also appears deep, deeply buried in a series of transcendent functions within the equation. So um, it is not possible to uh, uh, derive a explicit relationship for V-jet from this equation. It's too transcendently coupled. And there are some other ways you can do it, you know, binomial mathematical treatments, a, a series expansion, binomial expansion, various things like that you can do. But in, in, in actuality, they're, they're no better than ha showing the equation like this. And then when we want a solution, we can numerically solve for VJet. And so this is an important equation that describes the, uh, the turbo rocket performance. And it shows clearly the coupling between the jet velocity and the chamber pressure. Now, implicit in this equation is the fact that we've expanded the propellant, uh, we've expanded the gas and the chamber pressure to the ambient condition, uh, and so it sort of assumes that we have a nozzle uh, uh, area ratio that's capable of doing that. That's kind of baked into this kind of equation. Uh, the more general equation in which we have a fixed area ratio, um, the, the equation is somewhat more complicated, but that is shown in my new book uh, on the rocket engines. And uh, for a modest price, one can learn the secrets of even the uh, chambers, the turbo rocket engines that uh, are expanded to an exit pressure. Uh, I'll leave that for uh, the interested student. Uh, but the, the idea is basically the same, and that is, uh, that is the punchline kind of for turbo rocket engine equations. Now, I hope you'll take away a, a few ideas here. One is that. The turbo rocket engine concept is pretty simple. It's a lawn sprinkler with fuel and oxidizer. The performance, not so much. It's a little more complicated, but still tractable. And you know, um, I think one of the reasons that the turbo rocket never spun up or has this, uh, you know hasn't revolutionized the propulsion industry is that it. Uh, uh, that these fundamental physical attributes of it ha have not been fully understood. In fact, they've been misapprehended. And so I felt it was my job uh, in my own uh, you know, way to try to explicate this, these systems and then share this with, with you all that, that might be interested in this and can see, maybe imagine the potential that these types of systems can provide. Okay. Um, it's at 627 right now. How am I doing on time, Tim? Am I doing okay? Are we all You're doing okay? all right. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I think I'm okay here. Uh, if you guys are enjoying this. Are you passed Yes. Let's look at the performance of the turbo rocket engine system. <laughs> Let's look at the performance of the turbo rocket engine, shall we? In this chart, I'm showing the specific impulse and the thrust generated by a possible uh, turbo rocket engine system as a function of the beta angle, the beta angle being the angle of the nozzle, as we just shown, relative to the axis of rotation. Now you can imagine that if we had a turbo rocket engine system that had zero beta, in other words, there was no angle of rotation, then this thing is just a conventional rocket. There's no rotation 
The rocket just comes out straight, it doesn't spin, uh, its chamber pressure is you know, close to that of the supply pressure. We can analyze it as a normal rocket engine, and in fact, the turbo rocket equations collapse to a standard rocket engine equation. That's good. We want that to happen. At the other extreme, when beta equals 90 degrees, we can imagine now that we have hero's wheel. We have the nozzles are all the way over. There's no axial component of thrust, so this machine makes no thrust. It just spins furiously. Uh, and so those are the two extremes. And as engineers as, and technical people, we, we know, we have an intuitive sense that there's probably an optimum in there. There's probably an extremum in there between those two terms. And in fact, there is. And the maximum thrust that a turbo rocket can produce occurs at a beta angle somewhere in this range. It's a function of the gas properties and sort of the design, but basically uh, it occurs at these large beta angles. So theoretically, it has a maximum uh, thrust that it can produce. Unfortunately, the rotational speed that occurs at this condition are, uh, well, it's kind of like the movie Spaceballs. It's ludicrous speed. Uh, there are no materials that would withstand those, those rotational velocities. So we never can actually physically get to the maximum thrust uh, beta angle for a system. However, uh, the ISP also takes a similar curve. It takes a similar path. But fortunately, uh, because of the details of the, um, of the performance, the maximum ISP occurs at a relatively small beta angle. And this is the beta angle that we can actually achieve. And that's good because ISP, specific impulse, the gas mileage, thrust per unit, flow rate of propellant through a system, uh, is something we really want to get at. So we can actually achieve that in turbo rocket engines of practical interest. Also, you can see that by changing the beta angle, we can adjust the thrust, even at the low beta angles, and this is a way that we can throttle the turbo rocket engine by changing the beta angle. That's an important, important technique. Okay. Why do we care about pump-fed rocket engines? Why don't we just go pressure-fed rocket engines all day, every day? It's because they're heavy. And, and they're heavy because the propellant tanks have to be a lot higher pressure than even our chamber pressure, usually at least twice, or, or better, right? So uh, if you have a uh, chamber pressure and a pressure-fed rocket of, say, 500 PSIG, your tank pressure needs to be probably at least around 1,000 PSIG, maybe more. And you have to have tanks that can withstand that high pressure, as well as a propellant system. So those become heavy, and they become exponentially, or they become uh, uh, geometrically heavy um, the more propellant you carry. This is why launch vehicles are not pressure-fed systems, because the tanks are too heavy. So we use pumps. This is the history of rocket engine development is having pump-fed rocket engines that can reduce the tank weight but still provide high chamber pressure for the rocket engine. The problem with our conventional rocket engines is that they're expensive, they're complicated, they take a long development time, they're prone to failure, and uh, they're just, uh, you know, a lot to work with. The turbo rocket engine, with a small integrated size, uh, may provide a solution to that in which we can have a high performance a uh, pump-fed rocket engine in a simple, compact design uh, that can be developed uh, relatively easily and, and, and uh, tested. Okay, applications for the turbo rocket engine. Well, so what applications would the turbo rocket engine be useful for? Well, what applications would a pump-fed rocket engine be used, useful for? You know, what, 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 it's the same types of applications. So. We could conceive that you know if you needed a pump-fed uh, upper stage engine for space application, uh, especially a smallish one, this might be a good candidate. Small to medium launch vehicles could be accommodated with uh, turbo rocket engines if the scaling can be shown to be effective. And of course, uh, various vehicles that uh, uh, may need to transition the atmosphere uh, could benefit from the unique capabilities of the turbo rocket engine. In particular, combining the turbo rocket engine with air breathing engines to produce unique combined cycle engines has a great deal of promise, and uh, it's very an exciting uh, set of developments. And it's actually the the reason why I got into and became familiar with the turbo rocket engine. A number of years ago, I was in the dark, arcane library of an ancient uh, but special library, now destroyed, called the Redstone Scientific Information Center. There in the dimly lit halls of the RISC, I discovered a unique paper that articulated the performance of an air breathing engine which used a turbo rocket 
as the source of shaft power, but not as a source of thrust. And it was at that, that moment when I saw that paper that I realized that you could uh, integrate a turbo rocket engine into an air breathing engine and have these unique synergies that might be very useful for, uh, for propulsion applications. Those can be of the class of the turbine-based combined cycle engines in which you have spinning parts, or it can be an RBCC rocket-based combined cycle engine in which you just have a, a rockety part and air comes in and you interact that way. Okay. Lastly, um, let's talk about some of the drawbacks and challenges for the turbo rocket engine, because I think it's honest to state these. So after giving it some thought, uh, these are what I've identified as kind of the major drawbacks and limitations and technical challenges associated with the turbo rocket engine. Obviously, the dynamic loading additions um, are, are, uh, are considerable. Uh, the system is rotating at relatively high speeds, not, not crazy high speeds. Uh, rotational speeds comparable with conventional turbojet engine technologies uh, of, of a similar size, very similar. Um, but they're also at pressure and, and hot. So um, a dynamic rotating assembly that's at pressure, rotationally loaded, and, has, uh, and is hot, that's, that's a design challenge, but not insurmountable. The rotational lot, the rotational inertia of the rotating assemblies is also large because we're rotating our nozzles as well as our combustion chamber. Um, and uh, so that imparts some large rotational inertia to the system. But again, you know, we can look at conventional technologies such as large uh, turbofan type engines like the GE90 or the train engines. Those have very large fan systems. Uh, the fan systems uh, weigh in excess of uh, 2,000 pounds on those systems, and they're rotating at about uh, the mid 2000s RPM. So the rotational inertias on those systems are, are very large, and we know how to react to those systems with bearings and seals and things like that. There's some uh, issues associated with the scalability limitations. Frankly, we don't know what those are with these types of engines. We don't know how big uh, we can make them. Um, and so that is going to be a fruitful area for research um, as we uh, as we embark upon this exciting technical journey together. Lastly, um, there's the issue of technical immaturity. And this is a particularly pernicious type of limitation because of its recursive nature. Um, the system is technically immature because it doesn't have much development, and it doesn't have much development because it's technically immature. And so this ends up being uh, uh, an unending cycle of, uh, of, of, of do-nothingness. Uh, and so, uh, it, it becomes a, a matter of people uh, having the courage and the fortitude to embark on the development of these types of systems to see its development. And if we've learned nothing from the innovator's uh, dilemma or the innovator's decision uh, 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 solution, it's that the introduction of new technology is a difficult proposition, and it has to enter from um, uh, very basic needs that aren't fulfilled by conventional uh, conventional technologies. And so we have the classic problem of the introduction of new things. And so I'm going to read from my book. Um, and so I, uh, I like harkening back to, uh, to, uh, to the tradition of things. And so I, I quote from Machiavelli and from The Prince in that it must be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to manage than the introduction of a new system. For the initiator has the enmity of all who would profit by the preservation of the old system and merely lukewarm defenders of those who would gain by the new system. So this is our problem that we face with the introduction of the turbo rocket engine system. Um, and so you, my friends and colleagues, may have the courage and the interest to develop turbo rocket systems for your own applications if you have the fortitude to embrace these challenges. Let's look at some uh, videos. Uh, and as I'm getting that teed up, are there any questions? Yes. OK. So on the ERP previous slide, you had a thing about mass, maximum specific impulse for the uh, novel angle. Yes. Does that change based on the type of fuel you used at all? Do you treat the design to Yes. And it would be a function of the propellants. Yes, absolutely. Not a big change, but it, it would have some, yeah. I'm just curious, I'm not sure if it's a universal equation. Yeah, no, not, that, that was kind of a qualitative uh, uh, kind of expression 
uh, for that. Uh, Tim, you had a question? Yeah, um, so to uh, the issue with the rotational inertia, wouldn't you have to pair the engines together and have them spinning in opposite directions? Yes, that? That, that's a great idea, uh, and you can totally do that. Um, and you can, uh, yeah, you can spin it in op opposite directions. Now, this does not uh, eliminate the creation of gyroscopic forces. Um, each pair, each engine will generate gyroscopic forces, but they're so they're going to be torquing on the frame, but the, the airframe won't be. Uh, subject to a net torquing force. But yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, right. So this is a problem with uh, traditional liquid engines as well. How do you go through the bootstrapping process of starting one of these things? The startup process is, a, is not trivial. Um, and uh, it requires, uh, uh, it requires um, courage and imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will show you how we start the engine in this video. So you can see we can run for quite a while even with these types of systems. but then they, they transition to liquids. And that pr produces these unique performance attributes. Yes, Greg? What was RPMs? Uh, it was um, between 10 and 20,000 RPM. So uh, these, these numbers aren't, the performance isn't super good on this system. Uh, it, the design point was much higher than that. Um, how, close that's, you stand, how close were you standing to that hospital the camera there? Oh, it was many inches. Who's your chief safety officer? Let's see. Um, 
I'll show one other quick video. Um, this is This is a um, yeah, yeah, I should. So this is a uh, um, this shows some of our uh, our testing uh, with um, um, our data acquisition. And uh, we have a pressure case uh, that are shown uh, corresponding sync up to the film with the little movie first. So that's our command of rock over here. So John uh, Burton has put this together with a great system, really good part of the system. Okay, so this is the So uh, now, uh, oh, let me take a few questions. Yes. What was your uh, estimated chamber pressure and steady state on this? Well, <laughs> the um, for the for the test. Yeah. Uh, well, the design point operation was um, about a thousand psi g. Uh, we did not achieve that because we didn't achieve the rotational speed that we needed. But I'm um, glad you asked that because um, it's really important to understand that the Dynamic pressure, the isodynamic pressure that you're able to achieve due to the rotation can be very high. And this is, again, another amazing attribute of this system. You know, it's one half uh, rho u squared, and it's at the u max condition, not at the half uh, of the potential, uh, the, the, uh, not half of the uh, uh, relative uh, jet velocity. And so, um, so the, the pumping potential can be very high on these, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, and the other thing is uh, that um, it is difficult to measure the chamber pressure in a rotating system. Not impossible, but difficult. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Marit, did you have a question? Yes. It, uh, you said earlier that strength of materials is quite limited to the uh, max thrust. Doesn't that get better as the rotor gets smaller? Uh, yes. Yes, it would. So small guys could uh, pretty pretty zippy. I still don't think you could. Um, uh, you could uh, uh, achieve the maximum thrust of even a small guy. Um, I, I, refer, or I refer you to the uh, uh, section uh, 7 of uh, the uh, structural uh, analysis uh, section of, of, of the book, in which I provide some uh, examples of uh, uh, structural loading in, in rotating systems. Uh, highly simplified, but um, I did that to show the reader that um, Reasonable uh, uh, stress levels uh, were, could, could be accommodated within uh, a, rota a, a turbo rocket engine of practical interest. In other words, you could still achieve these nominal rotational speeds and, and not break your, your engine. You know, you, it, the conventional materials could be used to, to build these things, and that's kind of what we're, we're showing here. Okay, I'm going to keep going here. Um, how are we doing on time? Are we? Are we um, I just got a few more slides and then yeah. we're, we're going to be good here. Okay. Um, so um, now I'm going to move on to the section. And this is the idea of combined cycle engines in which the turbo rocket can be integrated into other air breathing systems. And I think this is a particularly amazing and fascinating area. And as I mentioned, this was the source of my original discoveries of the turbo rocket engine in conjunction with a particular air breathing engine known as an air turbo ramjet or a turbo rocket engine system, an ATR. And uh, it was from that experience uh, and observations that uh, uh, we developed a number of uh, interesting concepts. Combined cycle engines break out into two types. The rocket-based combined cycle engine, basically kind of rocket in a tube. Uh, but these kind of uh, manifest for the turbo rocket. It's like a turbo rocket integrated with a ramjet or a scramjet or even a ducted rocket. And the other main class is the turbo-based combined cycle engines, DBCC engines in which you have uh, the rotating elements um, of a, a fan or something like that. 
And in these types of systems, you take advantage of the unique attribute of the turbo rocket engine to not only make thrust, but to make shaft power, rotational shaft power. And this is a very unique attribute of the turbo rocket engine. You can take shaft power right off the system. Go figure. So let's look at a couple of these systems. Here's a, a notional uh, uh, ramjet kind of system with an integrated um, uh, turbo rocket. This is a turbo rocket design that I, that I have. Um, and uh, you can integrate that with a, uh, with a ramjet. And in that system, the ramjet would mainly function as the booster engine to get the ramjet up to flight takeover speed. Um, or it can also function, you can run it fuel rich, and it functions as the fuel injector for the afterburner, the ramjet combustor. You can also um, add, uh, potentially add a fan to these kind of systems and uh, have, a, um, have the advantage of a, of a, of a compressor type fan um, to induce a uh, larger airflow at a higher pressure ratio, extracting shaft power from the system. Um, I don't show any power balance shaft power extraction equations in the book. Um, I mainly show these for more uh, of uh, uh, conceptual interest. Uh, the most interesting design, in my opinion, is the combination of a turbo rocket engine integrated with a conventional turbojet engine. And this is known as an RTR engine. Uh, the acronym uh, became awkward and unwieldy. Uh, the R in RTR stands for RTR, and the TR stands for turbo rocket. So RTR stands for RTR turbo rocket engine system. So, and then we descend into madness uh, at that point. That's, that's as good as I can do. And that's what's on the patent, actually. So this engine, we basically take a conventional turbo rocket engine and we uh, connect it to the back of a, um, of a tip, uh, conventional uh, turbojet engine. We can supply propellants uh, through a hollow shaft. I've demonstrated that in some of the pictures you'll see. Um, and then we can, if we have a mechanical coupling, we can operate the turbo uh, jet as a normal turbojet. And then if we want to, we can uh, we can operate the turbo rocket as a pump fed rocket engine if we want to. But if we connect mechanically the shaft output of the turbo rocket to the, to the turbo jet and use the turbo rocket as a fuel injector, the shaft power powering the compressor, now we, have, we can enter an air turbo rocket mode with this system. So we get the synergy of the air turbo rocket baked in into this combination. So it's a, it's a unique engine kind of configuration and it was uh, it was so excited that uh, I talked about it for I don't know how many years uh, before I finally uh, built some parts. Um, and uh, here is a small uh, example of the, an RTR engine. This is a small turbojet engine. It's an RC model scale engine. And it actually has an integrated turbo rocket engine in the back. It's actually this engine here. So you can, you can kind of imagine the scale of this type of engine, how small it is. And uh, so this demonstrated, it, it didn't didn't have particularly good performance, but it demonstrated the fact that even on a very small scale, a turbo rocket could be integrated into a, um, into a turbojet engine. And uh, we were able to do some testing here. Here's some, uh, here's some of the components of it. Here it is on, on, on the test stand. And uh, I'll show a video of uh, some of the early testing with this system. So let's see. I'm try it here. Once again, can master the intricacies of the uh, So this is the little turbo rocket engine, um, and it's spinning here. I have a, 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 some cold gas appliance with the pressure to spin it up, and then I'm putting propellant through it. And you'll see that orange thing, which is the igniter. You have to ignite these turbo rockets kind of externally. Um, there are some other ways to ignite them. It's a technology thing by the book. But you can see how kind of we do it here in all its, in all its clumsiness. Shut off the, uh, the, the 
Let's go back here. And there you have it, Bob's journal. All right. In that picture, where's the exit gas coming out? I'm sorry, say again? Where's the exiting gas coming out in that picture? That you had just oh, yeah, and it's hard to see the flame. It's coming out of the turbo rocket engine, not the turbo jet. It's coming out of, it's coming out of this, this space here. Okay. So, uh, just to kind of, as we get towards the end here, so we can kind of conceptualize what kind of performance we might be able to achieve with these novel combined cycle engines in the RTR engine. So it has these different operating regions that it can transition through. So if we were like flying a system with the RTR, say some sort of conceptual transatmospheric plane that may have a high delta V emission, I'm not seeing an SSTL, but high delta V. We could see it ascending up through a particular ascent corridor, um, and which it might have this series of dotted lines, which could be um, its performance. So it's going to have high ISP in the three to 4,000 seconds as it's operating as a turbojet. This would be safe for hydrogen fuel. Then we transition to the air turbo rocket mode, and ascend along that particular performance corridor. Before its own velocity, uh, we would need to transition to, uh, to full rocket mode. Uh, and that's shown by the turbo rocket engine operating mode, it's a pump head rocket engine. So uh, if you have kind of performance like that, you know, some, uh, you can get some spectacularly high mission average delta Vs for systems. Just saying. Okay. So in closing, I'd like to provide a summary of the turbo rocket engine and its unique attributes. So the turbo rocket engine is at its essence an integrated pump-fed rocket engine uh, in which the combustion chamber, the nozzles, and the injectors all rotate together as one solid body. And this provides it with some unique performance attributes that are different from conventional rocket engines. Most importantly, the engine operates at a condition which we refer to as the U max or U rotational velocity is equal to the tangential component of the jet velocity. And this is in contrast to the fact um, that it does not operate at the maximum power shaft power output condition in which the rotational velocity equals one half of the tangential jet component, uh, tangential jet velocity component. Um, and so uh, this attribute of the turbo rocket engine performance was not fully appreciated and in fact it led to its uh, misapprehension of, of the fundamental operating conditions of the turbo rocket uh, engine itself. But with knowing that, uh, based on the power balance configuration uh, considerations that we showed earlier in this presentation, we can see how we arrive at that condition. Another unique attribute of the turbo rocket engine is that the jet velocity and the chamber pressure are coupled, meaning that, in a, like in a conventional rocket engine where the jet velocity is a function of the chamber pressure, in a turbo rocket engine, the chamber pressure is also a function of the jet velocity. And this is what is a unique uh, uh, separator compared to conventional rocket uh, motor systems. Because the um, propellants uh, enter the combustion chamber are the same relative uh, rotational speed, uh, the system uh, requires no diffuser on the effective pump outlet. Um, and so this again is another uh, unique attribute of the turbo rocket engine condition and can contributes to its uh, potential for high performance as a pump fed rocket motor engine, rocket engine system. The turbo rocket engine can generate both shaft power and thrust all in one unique system. Now at its U-max condition, uh, where we're making the maximum thrust, uh, we're not able to generate any uh, shaft power because there's no excess shaft power available. But at other um, uh, rotational speeds that are lower than the tangential component of the jet velocity, we can indeed generate shaft power. And this can be used uh, for other purposes within the engine system. Again, this is a unique attribute um, of the uh, turbo rocket engine uh, that the 
that the engine can do, produce both sh uh, thrust uh, and shaft power um, in one integrated system. Because the turbo rocket engine is sort of intrinsically simple, uh, it allows for its integration with other systems, and particularly with air breathing propulsion systems, um, such as turbojets, scramjets, ramjets, um, and other types of uh, air breathing engines, allowing us to create unique combined cycle engine concepts with performance attributes that are unmatched with uh, conventional systems. And so this uh, bodes well for the future of the turbo rocket engine as a, um, as a potential uh, technological resource for improving these types of engines. The engine is scalable. Uh, we believe that turbo rocket engines um, up to a quarter of a million pounds um, may be possible. Right now we're focused on the smaller end of the, uh, of the spectrum, um, you know, turbo rocket engines uh, below 500 pounds of thrust. And this is a very good position uh, to start the turbo rocket engine because it's an area that is, that is um, not met by conventional uh, pump-fed rocket motor systems. Normally, uh, pump-fed rocket motor, uh, rocket engine systems uh, are, are higher thrust than this, and it's hard to scale them down to these small sizes. But the, the turbo rocket may, may be able to operate well in, in, in that condition, and we may be able to scale, scale it up as we wrap up here in, in our summary, up to uh, much larger values. Um, so at BSRD, my own company, we're doing a turbo rocket and a combined cycle engine concept known as the RTR engine uh, development. We have active development efforts going on. These include the development of analytical models, uh, which predict the performance of the turbo rocket engine and how it can be sized and designed for particular applications. We've built uh, multiple um, hardware prototypes. We're up to our sixth generation of turbo rocket engine prototypes, the Turbo Rocket Mark VI, and we're actively, uh, actively conducting uh, hot fire engine testings on uh, primarily the turbo rocket engine, uh, but we have also conducted hot fire testing on the combined cycle engine RTR engine prototypes. Patent was granted on the RTR engine, um, and it was published in uh, 2015, and it's currently active, um, and it's available for licensing if one is interested in the attributes of the RTR for their own propulsion applications. In August of 2022, a technical book was published uh, on the turbo rocket engine known as, uh, which was entitled Design and Analysis of Turbo Rocket Engine Systems. So I published this book um, with the aim of describing the uh, the turbo rocket engine, how it works, and how to design these things, uh, how these, how to design these types of engine systems. And in particular, I provided a computational methodology for computing the performance of the turbo rocket engine. Um, and these design uh, methodologies are applicable uh, for both uh, monopropellant type rocket engines as well as uh, bipropellant uh, rocket engine systems. Lastly, I'd like to remind everyone that the turbo rocket engine is open source. Uh, the technology for these types of engines is provided um, in which anyone that is interested in working on these systems and developing their own turbo rocket engine systems uh, for their own applications and using the methodologies providing in uh, design and analysis of turbo rocket engine systems, the book, um, or the papers that I published on that is, is free to do so. And it is my belief that uh, by having an open source configuration for the turbo rocket engine technology, we have the best chance of uh, seeing this type of engine system uh, developed and, uh, and embraced by the, by the aerospace community. Um, the more people that uh, have a chance to try out their own ideas with the turbo rocket engine, the better chance we'll have successful designs. And so thus the turbo rocket engine technology is open for those who are interested in pursuing this and have the courage to try new technology systems. If you'd like to learn more about the turbo rocket engine operation and see some actual videotapes, you can check out my YouTube channel on this turbo rocket. Um, I have a number of videos showing uh, design and development of systems and some hot fire engine testings. If you like and subscribe to this, uh, to the channel for the videos you see, it directly helps the development of turbo rocket engine technology and moves us to a state where we might be monetized um, on various social media condition, uh, social media channels. Uh, and this would be a way to uh, move forward the technology development of the turbo rocket engine. 
Again, to really, uh, my book on the subject, Design and Analysis of Turbo Rocket Engine Systems, is available on Amazon. If you really want to go deep into the technical details of turbo rocket engine design and operation, uh, then uh, this might be the book for you. If you'd like to contact me for further uh, for further discussion, uh, um, I provide my contact information here. You can reach me at email at I am trrockin at gmail.com. And again, please visit the website um, at turborockin.com and also uh, check out the YouTube channel, um, Turbo Rockin, to see some of our developments and some, some other uh, uh, things that we're doing. And your liking and subscribing helps Turbo Rocket Engine technology development. Thank you for your interest and participation in our presentation. Um, it's been my pleasure to give you this information, and I hope it inspires you for further technology development of the Turbo Rocket Engine. Thank you.